Because we're preparing for, for the next season. We're preparing for the next season of life. I mean, right now we've been this a pilgrim church for so long. And soon we're going to be in a building. It's going to be absolutely amazing. So pray for us because we need to be ready. There's going to be new challenges in a building. There's going to be new things that are going on as we go and inhabit a building. There's things that we haven't even thought of that are going to happen as we go and inhabit that building. And we need to be ready. Pray that the Lord would prepare us for the challenges, the new challenges that are ahead. Because here's the thing, if you start to think about this idea of being ready, have you ever gone somewhere or you've ever something, maybe something happened to you and you were just totally unprepared? You were not ready. And when those things that happen, then you're just not ready. It's like you get, you get blindsided by these things and you're just not ready for them. You get blindsided and you realize, oh my goodness, I was not prepared for what just happened. I'll tell you a funny story and then I'll tell you a little bit more of a serious story. Our funny story, maybe, maybe you've heard this one before because I've shared it from time to time, but my daughters are starting to get to that age where dating is a possibility. And so my wife comes up to me and she's thinking about this and she says, you know, Eli, if our daughters date and, and when they get married, um, your parents are going to be grandparents. And I looked at my wife and I said, my parents are already grandparents. <laughs> Her response to that was, you can't take me alive. <laughs> we, we might need a little bit of time to be ready for the next season of life that we may enter into. Who knows when that's going to be. But in seriousness, I got to talk with Brother Solomon this week, and it was, it was a really good, at, at the end of our conversation, I asked him, what's it look like, Brother Solomon, to be ready to play professional football? Because Brother Solomon, back in the day, the glory days, he was there playing football on the West Coast. What does it look like to be ready to play football? And, and, he, and he said, you know what, you've got to have the right equipment. If you get out on that field and you don't have the right equipment on, you're going to get just totally blasted. You're not going to be ready for the challenges that come on that football field. And I began to think about what Solomon shared with me, and I, and I was thinking about it, and I said, you know what? It, there's more than just the right equipment, if you start to think about it. There's, there's, your body has to be ready. You don't just get to go out on the football field and be like, hey, I'm going to be, I'm going to play football. No, there has to be exercise, and there has to be self-discipline that goes into it. And then I began to think it's more than just your body. It's your mind. You have to start mentally preparing to, to either hit somebody. I don't know about you, I'm not ready to hit somebody. I look at Saul, I mean, he's ready. He's like, I'm gonna, I, I can just give you that little forearm shiver, and you're going down. You gotta be ready to hit somebody, or you gotta be ready to take a hit. Either way, there's, you, gotta, you gotta know the playbook. Back in the day, those playbooks might not have been too complex, but now I see those quarterbacks, they have that thing on their arm, and they have to flip through like three pages to find the play that they're calling. Like, how many plays do you got in that playbook? They memorize it all. There's an idea of being mentally prepared to get out there on that football field. And if you miss any one of those things, preparing your body, preparing your mind, having the right equipment, it's going to show that you are not prepared, that you are not ready to play. Being ready can be tough. Probably one of the toughest things to be ready for is actually what we're all doing right now, life. It can be tough to be ready for all the curveballs of life that get thrown at us. Because they come and all of a sudden, I, I mean, some of, these, some of these guys throwing that baseball, I just, I can't even believe what they do with that baseball. It just curves and goes all over the place. But we have to be ready for the challenges of life. We talked about it last week. There was two challenges last week. We were talking about a, a heart that covets. And it was shown in two ways. You have to be ready for these challenges. You have to be ready for prosperity. Because in times of prosperity, it really shows who you're trusting in. When we have a desire for more and more, and, and we believe that we're going to find satisfaction in things, it starts to reveal our heart, shows that we are not satisfied with God. We have to be satisfied with the Lord. That heart, that covets is also revealed. Jesus told us it's revealed in the need and the trial, the challenges of life. There's anxiety and worry that come upon us for the next steps. Lord, what are you doing? It's so easy to start looking at some of these challenges that face us just as individuals and maybe even as a church and start to say, Lord, what are you doing? And in those trials and challenges, we begin to have anxiety and worry showing that we do not trust that God is good and has a plan. For me, that has a plan for us. The root there is the lack of faith. Do we have faith that God is going to do what's right? 
Do I have faith that God is going to do, do, do what's best for me? Do I have faith in the Lord? Paul gave us the secret to navigating through the challenges of life to remember what it was. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Depend on God. Look to the Lord. He hasn't failed. The Lord hasn't failed and he's not going to fail. He's not in the business of failing. His plan is going to go on. And tonight, tonight what we're going to see is Jesus is going to give us the ultimate answer. He's going to say, there's, there's one thing that I want you to look at as you navigate through the challenges and trials of life. There's one thing that's going to keep you on track. There's one thing that's going to keep you uh, going through those challenges. There's one thing that is going to prepare you for the battle. There's one thing that you should do, that you must do to be ready. And so if you have your Bibles, please turn with me. Luke chapter 12. We're beginning right there in verse 35, and I'm reading out of the ESV this evening. Father God, we thank you that we can come. We thank you that we can get into your word. We pray, Lord, that you would speak. That you would speak a word fitly spoken just for me this evening. Lord, that I could hear your voice, that I could hear it so clearly. And Lord, I could apply it to myself and, and take action. Lord, that I could leave this place changed, that you would change me from the inside out. And so, Lord, we commit this time to you. Lord, we are your church. We, have, we want to have those ears to hear what you would say. And so fill us fresh with your spirit. Give us your mind as we get into your word this evening. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Verse 35, it says this, Stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning. Remember what's going on. We are in the midst of an absolute chaotic time. Jesus has called this generation an evil generation. Jesus has gone to dinner with the Pharisees. And before dinner even starts, I mean, it just turns into this radical time of Jesus calling out the, the religious leaders. And man, dinner, they leave and the crowd is outside. And this crowd is so massive. They begin to trample each other to get to Jesus Christ. And so Jesus is sitting there, and in the midst of this chaotic crowd, in the midst of all this craziness going on, the thousands of people around him, he uses this as a time of teaching. He says, I'm going to start teaching in the midst of this craziness. Here's a lesson for you guys. And the interruptions happen, and, and the teaching continues and goes on. And Jesus, I mean, he sits here, he says, hey, guys, you've got to be ready. And watch for my return is what Jesus is going to tell us this evening. And why is Jesus going to tell us to watch for his return? He's there. You got to remember the nation has rejected him. They have said, no, Jesus, you are casting out demons. You're here because you're, you're possessed by the prince of demons, Beelzebub. You're possessed by Satan himself. And they reject the Messiah. The, the people, they have all the information they need to choose Jesus and they reject him. And so he begins to tell those gathered the best way to be ready for the challenges of life today is to look for my second coming, to look for my return. Because Jesus knows there's going to be a challenge. It's a challenge to steer clear of those, those times where we have a desire for more. There's going to be a challenge to steer clear from the dangers of anxiety and worry. Jesus knows that as you go through life, there will be challenges. There's not a one of us in this room that say, I had no challenges as I went through life. No, we all have faced challenges. Every single one of us knows what it's like to face challenges. And Jesus tells us that we need to be on watch for the challenges and be ready to battle. Because there will be a battle until we get home to heaven. Watch for the challenges that are coming. Be ready to battle. Set your mind to be ready to battle. And how was Jesus ready, for, ready to battle? How was he ready? He disciplined himself. What did he do? He had a passion for God's word. This guy knew, Jesus knew God's word in and out. Every time he was tempted, what did he say? It is written. He knew the very word of God. He said that example of studying and being in God's word. He also had a passion for prayer. He would leave early in the morning, go to a remote place and pray. We would call that, what would we call it? We would say, Loving God. There's an example for us. Of we have to have a love for God. And yet Jesus' love for God doesn't just stop right there. It's not just, hey, I'm going to have my devotional time. I'm going to get in the word. I'm going to be a man of prayer. No, I have compassion on others. Jesus had a great compassion for the others that were in his midst. Every, I mean, it all, often talks about how he healed everyone that would come to him. He would minister to everyone that would come to him. We have to have a compassion for others as well. We call that loving others. And then, I mean... <laughs> We have to have the same mind as Christ. 
What kind of Christ, what kind of mind did Christ have? He had a humble mind, the mind of a servant. This is the mind of Christ. To walk in humility, we need to have the same mind as Christ. And he had the same equipment, the armor of God. Go read Ephesians chapter 6, starting right there in verse 10 to 18. That we are to stand, stand on the foundation of Jesus Christ and put on the armor of God. Stay dressed for action. Be ready for the challenges ahead. Do not let the challenges of life catch you by surprise. Because so often I think we expect there to be no challenges. We're going to follow God and there's going to be no challenges in life. Everything's going to be great. No, there's challenges. There's trials that come upon each and every one of us. It happens when you just drive down the street, there's challenges. Strip stay, dress for action. And then Jesus says, keep the lamps burning. And for me, there's a call here to be filled with the Spirit. Mike's favorite book in the Bible, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. Be being filled. Do not be drunk with wine, which is debauchery, but be being filled with the Spirit. Be under the control of the Spirit. As you go through the challenges of life, there's only one way you're going to make it through, is to be under the control of the Holy Spirit. Keep that lamp burning. The challenges of life are not just going to magically disappear. The challenges of life are, are going to get more intense and frequent as we move forward. We have to be continually ready to face the challenges of life. I mean, remember what Jesus has told this generation. He says, you guys are an evil generation. The Messiah is here and you don't even see it. You're an evil generation. But then he said some of the greatest words ever. He says, but something greater is happening in this evil generation that has never happened before. There's something greater that's happening here. And this something greater is still happening today. Salvation is going out to the entire world. God is providing salvation and hope for a world that's absolutely hurting. Any one of us that have any, any type of, even a small contact with the world, you know how much people are hurting in the world today. You know the hurt. You know the things that are going on. And so Jesus commands us, be ready. There's challenges that are coming. I'm sending you as an ambassador to this world, so be ready. And this command to be ready to watch for his return, it's a great command. And Jesus says, I'm not only going to give you the command to be ready, I'm not only going to give you the command to stay dressed for action, to be filled with the Spirit, I'm going to show you what it looks like. What should our mindset look like? And Jesus uses the illustration of a servant. And be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast, so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. We're to be like a servant waiting for the master's return. Sitting there in, a, in the home, waiting for the master's return. And I find it very interesting that Jesus uses the illustration of a wedding feast. Here the master has gone to the wedding. It's most likely he is the groom, bringing back his bride. And it's very interesting that he uses this because the reality of it is when the, when the groom goes to bring the bride back to the house, it's usually late at night. It doesn't, it's not just like, oh, I'm going to come home at 9 o'clock. No, it's going to be midnight. It's going to be 1, 2, 3, 4 in the morning sometimes. And here are these servants that are all waiting for the master to return. They're sitting there. There's a challenge in this for us. They're to care for the house. They're to be ready. They're to keep the lamps burning. They're to be ready for when their master comes home with his bride. You guys know. What is the greatest challenge? Any of you guys that have worked in any business? You know when the boss, what is that saying? There's a saying, when the boss is away, what is it? The mice play and the mice will play. When the boss is away, the what happens? What is, what is the greatest temptation that goes on in any business place when the boss is not overseeing what you guys are doing? They slack off. They slack off, lazy, all these things. I mean, I, I wrote it down. They're lazy. They're goofing off. Sometimes I've even seen people asleep on the job. We're just, just going to take a nap. They do whatever they want. The mice are playing. They're doing whatever they want. If they do not watch and anticipate the master's return, they will fall into complacency. We have to anticipate our master's return. Because now here's a really good question. What do we see in the church today? As we look at the Western church especially, what do we see in the West? Western church? Well, laziness. I'm going to illustrate this with a story. I was on a mission field. And I asked the pastor on the mission field, because there was, uh, on the mission field, the, the, the Christians on the mission field were radically different from, from America. And, and I said, point out to me the difference. What is the difference between the churches here in the villages and, and the churches in America? Because this pastor had happened to be both, had you know, lived in this country and also had traveled to America. And he said, Eli, 
let me tell you the difference. In these villages, in these, these remote villages that you, that you go to, he said, we battle the enemy. We battle Satan. We have to be ready. It's a constant battle, day in and day out. It is a constant battle for us here in the villages. We are totally shunned by everyone else. Nobody wants to have anything to do with us. There is a constant battle that goes on in these villages. We have to be ready. In America, you battle sleep. You battle laziness. And man, it was so convicting to my heart. As I thought about what this pastor said as he looked at both of these churches, how are we to battle laziness? Jesus is giving us the, the number one thing to do right here. How do you battle laziness? Have the attitude of a faithful servant. Waiting for your master's return. Waiting and not only waiting, but anticipating that the master can return today at this very moment when he knocks at the door. Are you ready for him to knock at that door and say, come on up, Eli, it's time to get out of here. Are you ready to go? Or did you leave something undone that I commanded you to do? Are you ready? How am I ready? Do I have a passion for the Lord? Do I love God? Do I desire to be in his word, to hear from him daily? Do I, do I spend time in prayer? Following the example of Jesus Christ, do I spend time in prayer? Do I have compassion on others? Do I use my time, talent, and treasure to be a blessing to those that God has put me in contact with? And where does that begin? Who is the, who's the closest people that God has put me in contact with? It's my own family. Do I have compassion for my family? Do I love as I'm supposed to love my wife and my kids? Am I using God's gifts in the, in the body of Christ, the church family that God has put me in? Am I using my gifts and abilities and being a blessing to the church family? And what about my work in the community at large? Do I do what God has called me to do? Am I a blessing? Do I walk in humility towards others? Or do I think that I'm, I'm better? And these are, these are challenges. These are personal, real, very personal questions. I cannot answer it for you. This is a question between you and your Lord. Are you ready for Christ's return? It's not all of us, we hear that, we say, of course I'm ready. Of course I'm ready. Don't you know who I am? I'm a pastor. I'm born ready. Being ready takes work. If I don't put in the time, you know, like I'm talking to Brother Saul, if I'm not preparing my body physically, if I'm not preparing my mind, if I don't have the right equipment on, I'm not going to be ready. There's, an, there's, a, there's the idea that, man, there's things that I need to be doing to follow the Lord. There's things that I need to be doing to be a blessing to others. I'm, I'm telling you, I don't just wake up and be like, I'm going to love my wife like Christ, love the church. That's a, that's a choice. And many times I fail. But there's a choice that has to be made. Am I, walk, am I doing these things? These are questions between you and your Lord. I can't answer them for you and everyone. All of us, we're going to give an account for these things. All of us will give an account. And notice, I mean, the, but the Lord has, what does he say? He says, hey, if you are ready, let me tell you what's going to happen to those who are ready. Because look at what he says. He says, verse 37, blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes, truly I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at table and he will come and serve them. If he comes in the second watch or in the third, I mean, it's trying like midnight, two, three in the morning and finds them awake. Blessed are those servants. Jesus tells the disciples, he's telling the crowd, if you stay dressed for action, if you stay ready, filled with the spirit through the challenges of life, when you meet the master, you will be blessed. When you meet the Lord in glory, you will be blessed. Now, I, I think about that. When I meet the Lord in glory, I'm going to be blessed. And it's true. But why do I need to be reminded of that? Why do I need to be reminded that when I meet the Lord in glory, I'm going to be blessed? I think that's a very interesting question because what Jesus is saying, he's saying, you believers, you who believe in me, you're going to be tempted to feel that you're not blessed now. You're going through challenges and there's no blessing right now. It's hard. The Lord doesn't see the things that are going on. Why? Well, comes another question. I want you to think about this for a moment. Is it easy to serve the Lord as you walk on this planet? Is it easy 
to serve the Lord as you walk on this planet? What do you think? Think about it for a moment. Is it easy to serve the Lord? I'm gonna, I'll give you some verses. I think the answer could be yes. Why? Matthew. Jesus says, hey, is, are, are you burdened and heavy laden? Is there challenges in your life? Come to me if you're burdened and heavy laden. I'm going to give you rest for your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So there's an element of it being easy to serve the Lord as we walk on this planet. And we also know that it's, it's not me who's working. Who's working? It's Christ in me who's working. And so there's this element of it being easy to serve the Lord. But if it was all easy to serve the Lord, then we would all be doing it 100% of the time. And as I begin to think about that, in a sense, the answer is also no. In a sense, it's a yes, but in a sense, it's no, because I just, do I find it easy to love my wife as Christ loved the church all the time? That's God's command to me as a husband. Do I find it easy to do that 100% of the time? No. You can ask Lorena. Lorena, do you find it easy to submit to Eli 100% of the time? Because that's, that's, that's a command of God to her. Does she find it easy to do that 100% of the time? Then I'll ask you young people, all of you young people, you're going to answer this easy. Do you honor your father and your mother 100% of the time? Always. All you kids are like, of course, I honor my parents 100% of the time. I'm... Eli, that's an easy one. Do you find it easy to respect your boss? Because you know you're not working for him or her, but you're working for the Lord. Do you find it easy? Do you find it easy to watch the words that you say? Do you find it easy to watch what your ears listen to or what your eyes consume? I haven't even gotten to the thought portion, and I won't even go there. Is it easy? So in a sense, it's easy, but in a sense, it's not easy. And Paul tells us this very clearly. I love what Paul says about this. It's in Romans chapter 7, verse 18 and 19, and then its conclusion in verse 24 and 25. Paul says this, For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh, for I have the desire to do what is right. I have the desire to love my wife as Christ loved the church. I have the desire to do these right things. I have a desire to honor my parents, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want. Oh, man. But the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Of course, none of this is, this is, this is not for you guys. It's just for me. Just, just for me. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Who? I love it. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Because that's the only way. This is the only way. Paul is very clear. It is challenging to be ready. It is challenging to walk in faith. Why? Because we have a sin nature. There is a nature within us that says, I want to do what I want to do. And I want to do it now. We have a Burger King mentality. My way right away. We know the good we should do. The Holy Spirit is there convicting us of the good we should do. And we have a desire to do the good. But many times we do not even carry it out. What my need is, is the same as your need. It's the same as all of our needs today. Our need is what? He says, deliverance is my need. I need to be delivered from this body of sin and death. And how does that deliverance happen? Salvation. It happens at the cross. That the God who saved me when I first believed is the God who is saving me today. And it's the God that will ultimately save me when I stand before him in glory. It's the same God. And therefore, I need to understand, just like you need to understand, I'm a work in progress. I'm not standing before you as a man who's complete. I'm not. You're not standing before me as a man or a woman who's complete. How do I know? You're not standing before the Lord yet. God is still working in you. There's still work to be done in my life. There's still work to be done in your life. There's opportunity in my life for massive growth. There's opportunity in your life for growth, change, learning, all kinds of things. And therefore, we're reminded, look to Jesus. Look to the Lord. Keep our eyes on him. Choose. There's a choice that has to be made. Be ready. I'm going to choose. As Joshua says, choose today. And this is a daily choice. And it's more than a daily choice. It's a moment-by-moment -moment choice. Joshua says, choose today who you're going to serve. Because we make that.
a choice. Who am I going to serve today? Joshua says, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Choose to walk in obedience. Choose to endure. And when we see him face to face, we're going to be truly blessed. We're going to be blessed when we see the Lord face to face. And this is something interesting that we learn about glory right here. Because what happens? You guys know what happens? If you were a servant and your master, like, like if Giovanni, if I was a servant of Giovanni and Giovanni's getting married pretty soon and he goes and he has a great wedding, he goes on his honeymoon and I'm supposed to be back watching his house. What is Giovanni and Jen going to do when, when they get back and I open the door to them? I'm like, I got, I got the house clean, Gio, everything's ready. It's all in order, everything's great. What is Giovanni going to do? He's say, good job. Now make me dinner. <laughs> and I'll say, yes, sir. I'll make you dinner. Look at what it says is going to happen here. Did you see what it says is going to happen here? Truly, God, Jesus will dress himself for service and have them recline the table, and he will come and serve them. It's the absolute opposite of what should go on. When the master gets back from the feast, he's the one that's going to serve. He says, I'm going to serve you guys. He's going to minister to his servants. Wow. What a great encouragement for us. I wrote about it in the Shepherd to the Sheep. We're remembering, you know, it's 9-11 tomorrow. How many years? It was in 2001. It blows my mind. I still, you remember, as soon as you say those words, you remember right where you were when you got the news. You, you remember turning on the TV. You remember the first time you saw those pictures. You remember that slogan that we had, never, never forget. We're not going to forget the New York Police Department. I think it's so funny how we've turned so quickly on, on those who gave their lives. We turn so quickly on them. We're never going to forget the, the police department. We're never going to forget the innocent lives lost. We're never going to forget our servicemen and women who stood in the gap for us to protect the freedoms we enjoy. We're never going to forget it. And it's just so interesting to me because the Lord doesn't forget. He doesn't forget. He's seen the tears that we've cried. He's seen the things that we've gone through. He keeps a record of what has been done for him. And there's going to be a day where we stand before him. He's going to wipe away our tears, that we will be rewarded for the service that's gone on, that we've done in him here on this planet. We'll hear those words, good and well done, good and faithful servant. We're going to be so blessed when we meet the Lord in the air. Paul reminds us of 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Daniel gave, gave this verse to me on Thursday, I was thinking, that verse is going to be in the sermon on Sunday, Daniel. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 through 18. So we do not lose heart. It's so easy to lose heart. It's so easy to look at the things going on in the world and say, I'm going to lose heart. We do not lose heart. Believers do not lose heart. Why? Though our outer self is wasting away. And as I get older, I mean, when I was young, I didn't understand that verse at all, outer self wasting away. I can eat whatever I want to eat and drink whatever I want to drink and I will lose weight. That does not happen anymore. <laughs> I cannot eat whatever I want to eat. My outer self is wasting away. Our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. There's an eternal weight of glory coming this light. He says, he says what I'm going through right now, Eli, what you're going through right now is light and momentary. And I'm saying, Lord, this is not light, nor is it momentary. It seems like it's going on forever. But it is momentary, and it is light compared to what? Compared to the glory. Because it's preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, they're temporary, they're going to pass away. But the things that are unseen are eternal. Look to the things that are unseen. Look to the eternal. Remember that you're headed somewhere. You're headed to glory. And Jesus finishes the sign. He says this. As he finishes this thought, oh man, but know this, verse 39, that if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have, have left his house to be broken into. You also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Here Jesus speaking specifically of his rapture, he says, man, I'm coming like a thief in the night. You need to be ready. I'm coming like a thief. Be ready. The world is not going to expect Jesus to rapture his church. The world is not expecting Jesus to come again. How do I know? 2 Peter tells me, Peter tells me, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 3 and 4. Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing. Following their own sinful desires, they will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. 
There are people right now, the world right now is saying, Jesus is not coming again. Do you know when people say Jesus is not coming again, they're fulfilling prophecy. The last days, there will be so many that say, Jesus is not coming again. God's not real. He's not coming again. All things are continuing as they have from the beginning. There's no change. There's nothing going on. The last days are going to be full of people like that. They're going to reject the Lord. They'll openly mock God. They'll persecute believers. They'll persecute Christians. They're not going to believe that Jesus is going to come again for his bride. And therefore, when Jesus does come again, that day comes upon them unexpectedly. The world is not expecting Jesus to return. But you need to expect Jesus to return. This is what Paul says. This should not be an unexpected event for us. Paul says this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 2 through 6, For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come as what? Like a thief in the night. He's quoting Jesus Christ. He's just saying it's coming as a thief. The day is coming. This is what Jesus says. Well, people are saying there's peace and security. Then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman and they will not escape. Why? Because it will come upon the entire world. That tribulation period will come upon the entire world. But you are not in darkness. You are not. This is what Paul says. You are not in darkness, brothers, sisters. You are not in darkness for that day to surprise you like a thief. You should not be surprised at the coming of the Lord. Do you know what day he's coming? Absolutely not. You do not know what day he's coming, but it should not surprise you. Why? Because you're anticipating that it's today. So the day should not surprise you. For you are children of light, children of the day. We are not of the night of darkness. So let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. Be ready. Be ready for the return of Jesus Christ. We have to understand that as we look at the world, the time is short. Look at the world. Look at the craziness that is going on in the world. Go read Matthew chapter 24 and look at the characteristics of what Jesus says is going to happen with the planet in the last days. Wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, pestilence, all of these things will increase in frequency and intensity is what Jesus says. Do we see that happening? Absolutely. Go read 2 Timothy chapter 3 where Paul talks about the characteristics of humanity in the last days. People will be what? Lovers of self. Lovers of money. Disobedient to parents. Go read what it says and then go look at humanity and say, is, do I see this increasing in humanity around me? You do. Go look at it and then just go look at any newspaper. It doesn't matter whether you believe right-leaning newspapers or left-leaning newspapers. It doesn't matter. Go look at what he says in 2 Timothy and then look at any newspaper and you'll say, oh my goodness, Jesus is coming soon. He's at the very door. We know that the time is short. Therefore, we have to be ready. We have to watch. And as we watch, what are we to do as we watch for Jesus' return? So many people say, I'm just going to lazy around and do nothing. Mm. Well, I wait for Jesus' return. That's not what Jesus says. Jesus says this, verse 41. Peter said, Lord, are you telling this parable for us or for all? He's saying, is this just for the disciples? Is this promise of blessing just for the disciples or is it for everybody? Are you telling it just for, for us or for everybody? And Jesus is going to encourage us to have the title to work until he comes. And it starts with Peter. It starts with Peter's question, Jesus' answer. Have you ever been somewhere, maybe a conference, and you felt like that individual that's up there speaking is speaking directly to me? Have you ever felt that? That that word that's being spoken right now, that word is just for me. There's nobody else. It's just me and that person that's up there on the stage. It's just us. That's it. And it is so interesting because in the midst of all this craziness, can you even picture it? There's thousands and thousands of people jostling around Jesus and Jesus is giving this, this teaching to the disciples and those who are around them. And there's just crazy mass chaos. There's noise. And Peter is sitting there and he's hanging on every word that Jesus is saying. It's almost as if it's, it's just Peter and Jesus. It's just you and me. They're the only ones that were there in this teaching. Peter is just sitting there and, and all of this craziness is going on. And he's so caught up and he says, Jesus, this is impacting me so much. Are you just telling this just for me and for the disciples? Or is this for everybody? Is this word for everybody? Because it's impacting my heart so much to be ready for your return. 
Is it just for me or is it for everybody? And Jesus, he's going to tell him in just a second it's for everybody. But it leaves this particular passage. I love Peter. This particular passage leaves such an impression on Peter that it's one of the first things that he writes to the, to the early church. It's the one that 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13, it's almost as if he quotes Jesus as he writes. Go read this whole passage, because this passage ends with the encouragement to be holy as Jesus is holy. And he says this, Therefore, as you look at, at the things going on around you, prepare your minds for action. Be ready. Prepare your minds for action. Be sober-minded. Think clearly and critically about what's going on around you. Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Be ready for Christ's return. Anticipate and look for Jesus coming. I mean, this teaching moment here has impacted Peter so greatly that he takes this and he, he writes this to a young church. Jesus has telling Peter, man, as you wait for my return, Peter, there's work to be done as you wait for my return. And Peter writes this to the young church. There's things to do as you wait for the return of Jesus Christ. And what are the things that we need to do? It's found there in verse 42. And the Lord said, who then is the faithful and wise manager, the faithful and wise servant, the faithful and wise steward, whom his master will set over his household to give them their portion of food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom the master will find so doing when he comes as we wait. For Jesus to come, we are to work. We're to be busy about the master's business. To be busy about the Lord's business as we work. How are we to work? We're to be a blessing. Who's the one taking care of others? Who's that steward that goes out and makes sure that everybody is doing okay? Who's that one that's invested in the lives of others? Who's the one that's being a blessing and adding value? This is what the Lord is saying. Are you being a blessing and adding value to where I have placed you? Are you being a blessing and adding value to where the Lord has placed you this evening? Are you a blessing and add value to your home? Is your home a better place because you are there? Are you being a blessing and adding value to your workplace? Is your workplace a better place because God has placed you there? Are you being a blessing and adding value to your church family? Is this church a better place because you are here? Yes, it is. Are you being a blessing and adding value to others in your community, your neighborhood? Is it a better place because you're there? The answer to all those questions should be yes. Be salt and light. <coughs> Work where God has placed you because God hasn't made a mistake where he has placed you. Work until he returns. Work for the Lord and remember this. Remember this. Oh, man. Truly I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that servant says to himself, my master is delayed in coming and begins to beat the male and female servants and to eat and drink and get drunk, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him. And at an hour he does not know and will cut him in pieces and put him with the unfaithful. And that servant who knew the master's will but did not get ready or act according to his will will receive a beating, a severe beating. But the one who did uh, not know and did what deserved a beating will receive a light beating. The idea right here is that God is going to judge. God is going to reward and God is going to judge. We have to trust in the Lord. His reward is going to be completely just. His judgment will be completely just. He will reward those who have chosen to live a life prepared and ready. Live a life of faith, believing and walking in obedience to what God has called them to do. He will reward them in His coming. Set them over His His. What is it? His, his business. But he's also going to judge the unbelievers. And I find it interesting that the first ones that are called out, there's a severe warning there. For those that call Jesus master and yet do not live according to his will. Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things that I tell you? There's going to be those that stand before the Lord on that day and say, Lord, didn't we cast out all the demons? Didn't we do miracles of healing? Didn't we do all these amazing things in your name, Lord? We called you master. Matthew chapter 7, the scariest verse in scripture is when the Lord says, depart from me. I never knew you. We don't have a relationship. Your relationship with God has not been restored. There's a severe warning that God is going to judge those who only are paying lip service to him. 
Because there are people in this world that only pay lip service to the Lord. God is going to judge them. They call themselves Christians with their words, but they deny him with their lifestyle. We cannot be ones that deny the Lord with our lifestyle. They call God Lord and Master, but their relationship with him has not been restored. Over time, actions, their actions reveal their heart. They treat others poorly. They have no love for the Lord. They treat others poorly. They only care for the things of this world. There's no fruit of the Spirit evidenced in their life. Nothing to show that God has changed them and brought them from death to life. They live how they please. Time will reveal that, man, they were dead inside the whole time. They did not know the Lord. They think they're getting away with it, but they're not. The Lord knows how to judge, and he will judge at the right time and in the right way. We need to trust the Lord because he, the God of all the earth, is going to do what is right. And then there are those who have a relationship with God, and yet, man, they just don't move forward. So it is easy for us to judge those people. Oh, look at that person. Look at that guy. Look at that girl. They're not moving forward in their relationship with God. Paul says, let the Lord judge those guys. You, you take care of yourself. They're going to be judged as if they've gone through fire. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 talks about it. It says, the foundation, if you have the foundation of Jesus Christ, you're going to pass through fire at the Bema seat. And your works are going to be judged, what you've done for the Lord and what you've done for yourself. Paul says, these guys are, they're, they're going to make it to heaven, but man, there's not going to be much of a reward. And finally, there's those that come to the Lord, and yet for whatever reason, they're unable to grow. Maybe they're in a, in a country where following the Lord is outlawed, or maybe there's no church in their area, whatever. We don't know, but the Lord does. And here's what Jesus is saying. We need to commit judgment to the Lord because the Lord is going to judge in a just way in the right way, at the right time, with perfect justice. And finally, the last encouragement for us this evening, everyone to whom much was given, of him much will be required. And from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand the more. There's another warning, and really, this is Jesus, the warning for the leaders of, of the apostles that are there. He's, watch out, guys. The religious leaders that are all around, there's a warning there for the future church. Leaders, you're going to be judged at a higher standard. Watch out, you're going to be judged at a, at a higher standard. You've been entrusted to care for the flock of God, and, and he's going to hold you to a standard. Be careful. Live out in reality what he's called you to do. And there are those that take this passage, and it's so, so unfortunate, they take this passage and they say, you know what, I do not want to be judged to a higher standard, so I'm never going to grow in my relationship with the Lord. That's an absolute lie from the enemy. Let me tell you why. Look at the question that's up there. The final question on your screen. Think this through. What has been entrusted to you? What has been entrusted to you? Because what you say when you say, I'm, never gonna, I'm not growing in my relationship with the Lord. I, I choose not to grow anymore because I don't want to be judged. What you're saying, what you're saying is you love the lifestyle that you have right now more than you love following the Lord. Because the Lord is always call, calling you to grow. The Lord is always calling you to go deeper in your relationship with Him. He doesn't want to leave you stagnant. What has been entrusted to you is the very gospel of Jesus Christ has been entrusted to you. The gospel that you heard, the gospel that you believe, the good news. This is the word gospel. The word gospel is good news. There is amazing news that a world that is hurting needs to hear. And what is the amazing news? Think about it. Think back. Did you ever chase after things? You thought, you thought, man, if I chase after this thing, it's going to fulfill me. If I chase after the money, it's going to fulfill me. If I chase after my dream job, it's going to fulfill me. If I chase after this, if I chase after that, if I chase X, Y, Z, you fill in the blank. You know in your heart what you chased after. If I chase after it, if I acquire it, I will be totally fulfilled and my life is going to be perfect. We go through it, it's going to be daisies and roses for the rest of my days. If I just get that one thing, what happened when you got that one thing? If you were, if you were a man or a woman of, 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 of desire and drive, you got that one thing. I'm going to tell you what you did when you got that one thing. You were stoked. Yes. It's going to be great. And it was. For how long? Think back. How long was it great for? For a time. But 
then he found that it was hollow. It was empty. The world began to chew you up and spit you out. You started to look around and start to say, what is going on? Where can I find meaning and value and significance? There's too much pain and hurt in this world. And the gospel is so simple, the Lord knows your hurt and your pain. He's not oblivious to the pain and the challenge that you yourself personally have gone through. All the tears that you cry, he keeps in his bottle. Every one of them. Everything is written in his book. And he knows that this world that we inhabit right now, this was not the way the world was designed and created to be. You can look around every time a parent buries a child. You know this was not the way it was supposed to be. It wasn't. It's wrong. Your whole body screams it out. It's wrong. Why is this happening? This is not how it should be. You know instinctively that as you look at anything that goes on in the world, you look at the wars that go on in this world, you look at the atrocities that are committed every day on this planet, and you know this is not the way the world is supposed to work. But if we just did this, if we just did that, if we followed this leader or followed that leader, it's going to be great. And we'll finally have what we're looking for, a utopia. We'll make it. We will not. We will not. Because there will be a gentleman that comes upon the face of this planet that will promise a utopia. It will be the worst thing that ever happened to this world. This is what the Bible says. Do you find the world empty? The Lord knows. And so you ask the question, well, how did the world get this way? And you all know the answer to how the world got this way. We made a choice to disobey the Lord, to do it our way. Lord, I don't need you. I can do it my way. Adam made that choice with Eve. We messed it all up. We brought sin into the world. And it's been going downhill ever since. Ever since sin came into this world, it's been going downhill. And we can't escape. There's no escape. We're all sinners separated from a God. A holy God. And yes, God is a holy God. And yes, there will be justice and judgment. But God's not only a holy God, he's also a loving God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God said, justice and judgment is coming, but I don't want it to fall on you. So I'm going to do something. You cannot save yourself, so I'm going to do something about it. And what did God do? It's my, I love when Jim came up and he had, he did that study, every name of God, and he shared with us what it meant. And you all know my favorite, Emmanuel. God with us, God to the rescue. That God took on humanity, he became flesh. He lived like me. He knew what it was like to be hurt. He knew what it was like to go through trials and challenges. He knew what it was like to walk as a human on a lost world that's just totally depraved. He knew what it's like. He went through it. Can you imagine that? And as he went through it, and all those terrible things happened to him, he could have had so many opportunities to, to sin, but he's perfect. He's perfect. He never sinned. And then he said, I've lived the life that you should have lived, but you couldn't. I lived it for you. And now I'm going to take your place there on the cross. I'm going to take your place. I'm going to take the world's place on the cross. And I'm going to give my life so that you do not have to die. Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love towards us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This is the gospel that he was buried and that he was buried in the tomb and that three days later he rose again showing that he has victory over sin and death. And he calls, the call goes out to the world and it says, would you believe? 
Brothers, what must we do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You and your household. If you believe in your heart and confess with your lips, you will be saved. Believe that Jesus took your place, that you were a sinner and needed saving, and that Jesus took your place, took your punishment on the cross. Believe. Confess with your mouth that he is your Savior, that you will follow him, Lord. Whatever plan you have for my life, I'm going to follow your plan because my plan has brought me to terrible things. That's my testimony. My plan brought me to terrible things. And that call goes out to the world. If you're watching online, if you're here tonight, and you've never believed in the Lord, you have to do what the sinner did when he went before the temple. Father, forgive me. I'm a sinful man. Recognize your sin before a holy God. Recognize that he did something about it on the cross and say, Lord, I'm going to follow you the rest of my life. This is the gospel. This is the good news that's been entrusted to you. This is the only hope for a lost and hurting world. There is no other hope. There's going to be a gentleman that comes on this world and says, I have another hope. And the world will follow him. This is what the Bible says will happen. The world will follow him. It'll just end in destruction. It's a false hope. Because there's only one hope. And the hope is Jesus Christ. You need to do business with God. You need to be the one that prays and says, Lord, forgive me, I'm a sinful man. I repent of my sins. I believe in what Jesus did for me on the cross. And I will follow you the rest of my days. This is the prayer of salvation. In your own words, you pray that prayer. This is the gospel. This is what has been entrusted to you. What I just shared, this is entrusted to you. What have you been entrusted with? It's the very gospel of Jesus Christ. There's no greater thing. You've already been entrusted with everything. The very gospel has been entrusted to you. This, is, this is blows my mind because you have been rescued from this world. Those of you who believe in Jesus Christ have been rescued from this world. And as soon as you get rescued, you get that little rescue, the little, the little warm blanket thing that they give you, that, that metal blanket, you get all warmed up and you're ready. And you're like, okay, I've been rescued. And the Lord says, get back out there and let's, let's rescue some more people. He calls you and says, I'm going to send you right back out. I just rescued you from that. And now I want you to go back out and be that ambassador. Allow me to plead through you. As you're ready and watching for my return, allow the Lord to plead through you so that others can be reconciled to Jesus Christ. We've been entrusted with the gospel. We have to be ones that share the gospel. And so what is what the only question, the last question, what, what have you done with the gospel? Has it impacted how you live in your home? Has it impacted how you, how you work in your workplace? Has it impacted your treatment of others? Has it impacted these areas of life? Because that's the gospel. The gospel just isn't head knowledge. The gospel has impacted the heart and changed the life and changed the people around you. What have you done with the gospel? Share it. Be what you are. Light, as Mr. Sam would pray for us every Thursday. Be a light in this community. Be an ambassador of Jesus Christ. An ambassador of the King of Kings. There's no greater thing that we can be entrusted with than being an ambassador of Jesus Christ. This is who you are. If you are a believer, you are an ambassador. God has entrusted the gospel to you, and so I pray, my prayer is that you are encouraged this evening, that God is doing the work. Wait for the Lord's return. The days are dark. There's no question the days are dark. And if you look around, you see, you see the days are getting darker. And yet, God has you here on purpose, for a purpose. Stay dressed for action. Keep your lamp burning. Be ready. Be filled with the Spirit. Jesus is coming soon. And as you wait for his return, work. Work. Be a blessing and add value to the others that God puts you in contact with. Share the gospel with your words and with your actions and see as Mike's favorite scripture Ephesians God is going to do exceedingly abundantly above all you can ask and think in Christ Jesus Father God we thank you for this evening thank you for your word Lord thank you for the encouragement Lord that you are coming soon thank you for the encouragement for us to wait and be ready for your return thank you for the encouragement Lord to work as we wait to be a blessing to take care of others as we love you. Lord, give us a love for the others that you put in our lives. 
Lord, help us to be filled with the Spirit and go out from this place as your ambassadors, Lord. Help us to go as we come, Lord, as we, we come entering your gates with thanksgiving and we come into your courts with praise and help us to leave the same way. Lord, your word that you spoke to us, help us to take it to heart and put in practice this week what you've shown us. And so go before us, God. We love you. We commit this day, this week to you. In Jesus' name, amen.